You're listening to the Mushroom Revival Podcast. Hello, friends. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Josh Barch, who is the CEO of Midasin, a Canadian biotech company who aims to increase efficiencies in fungal pharmacology. They have a specialty in psilocybin, but focus on all functional mushrooms. Midasin has operations in Denver, Colorado, where they've built a 7,500 square foot lab dedicated to the research and development of these unique fungal compounds. We also discuss the economy of psilocybin as it is seen through the lens of Midasin and similar emerging businesses. And we apologize in advance for some of the noise issues in this interview, but without further ado, we bring you Josh Barch. Josh, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about Midasin. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and then give us a 101 pitch to Midasin? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, myself, my name is Josh Bartsch. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Midasin Innovations Group. Um, personally born and raised in, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, still reside here in, in Denver, Colorado part of the year. And then I'm fortunate enough to also reside in, in, in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, as far as Midasin Innovations Group, Midasin Innovations Group is kind of a, a global company focused on both both first and, gener- uh, first and second generation novel therapeutics revolving around different psychedelic compounds. So what we've been doing is basically taking nature's natural design of compounds like psilocybin and psilocin, using that as a template, which has a ton of great features, and then improving and making iterations from a pharmaceutical lens standpoint upon those initial designs to make them more applicable to therapy, to make them more acceptable in the FDA's eyes, et cetera. Things like shelf stability, being able to control half-life, et cetera, to make them much more scalable as well. And then additionally, Midasin has invested heavily in a technology platform by the name of MindLeap, which we're getting ready uh, in the next couple weeks here to to roll out MindLeap 2.0. We're incredibly excited about that. But MindLeap 2.0 is a community-based, really advanced, HIPAA-compliant telehealth platform that really kind of gives, gives a a solution to some of this, the scalability issues um, as it pertains to the psychotherapy protocols that's associated with some of these treatments. It's very onerous to expect patients to travel sometimes over state lines, sometimes over country lines for several psychotherapy interactions um, that don't actually involve any substances taken at all, um, that are one-on-one interactions both pre and post treatments. Um, that again are no substances taken at all. So Mindly provides a platform that those interactions can take uh, place remotely as well as uh, Mindly 2.0, which will have a, a ton of additional features, things like yoga classes, breath, breathwork classes, ancillary services that again are community-based that are from best-in-class providers uh, that really promote the overall mental health and well-being. So that's kind of mindly, or that's kind of Midasin as, as a company. Our two main focuses as far as indications are concerned um, are PTSD and, and uh, addiction. And how yourself did you get introduced to the fungal world or the world of entheogens? Sure. So, you know, professionally, I spent um, over a decade in, in the cannabis space. So I was, I was the third uh, legal cannabis license granted in the state of Colorado, which was really the first kind of uh, for-profit business structure on the planet, right? So we really innovated that um, in Colorado. I built a, a fully vertically integrated national company. It was really one of the first, if not the first, to do a, a state, um, a multi-state operation, single brand, et cetera, but it was a fully vertically integrated company um, and had a, a, a vast access to a multitude of, of the business and really saw what cannabis could do uh, from a healing perspective and then really understood kind of, you know, the different compounds that were associated with the cannabis plant, um, which ultimately ended up, uh, which, was, which is why I ended up partnering with, with Damon Michaels and, and, and Rob Roscoe, our COO and, and CSO, um, who came out of, out of um, a company by the name of Ebu, which was a Colorado startup initially really focused on the pharmacology aspect and under, understanding individually what these compounds did, um, and then looking at the entourage effect and 
uh, with the ultimate goal of having kind of predictive outcomes. In November of 2018, EBU was acquired by Canopy Growth for $429 million for the, the patent portfolio that they had, had built and really understanding that. We got together and kind of started talking about kind of the world of, of fungi and the world of mycology and how it was relatable to um, kind of the cannabis plant from a potential standpoint, but the world of fungi is much more vast and, and the potential is, is much more vast as well and also less understood, right? There hasn't been um, nearly amount, now there's starting to be an onslaught of, of significant research being done on both the, the functional mushroom side as well as the psychedelic side. But as far as the potential, it's really untapped. So it was an incredibly exciting opportunity and something that we jumped in really head first. And that's how Midasin was born. Yeah, you have a lot under your belt. And it's cool that I'm seeing, you know, Midasin using psilocybin and functional mushrooms. And you're pioneering a lot of R&D with, within both of those spaces. And could you talk about NeuroFarm? Like, who are these people and what? I know you guys are working with traumatized military populations. But yeah, if you could uh, kind of describe the relationship you have with, with NeuroFarm Inc. Sure. So NeuroFarm was actually um, our first acquisition that we did. So we fully acquired NeuroFarm. NeuroFarm is now a part of Midasin. So, so the entity of NeuroFarm um, is, is no longer in existence. However, um, the team of NeuroFarm and um, also their, their vision, their operations, et cetera, is now one of our key and leading um, initiatives. So um, our chief medical officer, which we were fortunate enough to be able to um, acquire during that transaction as well, is Dr. Rakesh Jetley. Um, Dr. Rakesh Jetley just retired in February after 31 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. The last 10 years, uh, he was the chief of psychiatry for the entire Canadian Armed Forces. Um, but has spent you know, 31 years obviously dealing hand in hand with different traumatic PTSD, et cetera, addiction that, that revolves heavily around both the, the current active as well as veteran populations. He's one of the world's expert, leading experts. He's chaired a number of NATO boards globally around the topics of PTSD in the veterans population. And kind of through that, we've been able to attract really the who's who from a variety of different um, governmental agencies, militaries, et cetera, most, mostly retired, et cetera, but of the rank of colonel or above that have really been pioneering PTSD research globally for the last you know, three decades. Um, so through that, obviously, inherently, we, we have launched um, our phase 2A clinical study around PTSD utilizing psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy as a generation one treatment for the treatment of PTSD. So if you re reverse back to the 1950s, 1960s, when there was a ton of clinical research being done on kind of this blanket depressive disorder, right? So 1950s, 1960s, PTSD was not an indication. That didn't happen until the 1980s when they actually classified it as an indication when they were like, you know, these nightmares, all these other things, what's really going on here? There's much more than just blanket depressive disorders. But if you look at the 1950s, 1960s, when they were treating, very successfully treating, this blanket depressive disorder with psilocybin assisted psychotherapy and other psychedelics as well, um, but specifically in our case, psilocybin, um, if you look at the derivatives of some of these patients that were being treated, it's from very traumatic events. So things like Holocaust survivors or war um, veterans, et cetera, that were coming home with these crazy traumatic experiences and really nowhere to turn. And then again, they were successfully treating. Obviously, 1960s, early 1970s, all of that was halted for political and bureaucratic reasons, right? That obviously we don't agree with, but we're very happy that this resurgence of, of treatment. So we're building up a very large body of evidence um, that we know that uh, this, this treatment works and will work very successfully. So that's really kind of the basis of, of why we launched our PTSD studies. So now we have approved test sites throughout Europe, uh, two in Europe that are military focused, three in, in, uh, in Canada, University of Alberta, Royal Ottawa, Western Ontario, and then three in the United States that are very veterans focused as well. Very prolific sites uh, that we'll be announcing here soon. Um, and the idea is, again, is to really understand, right now there's more questions than we have answers, but we do know it works, but we don't know what the best protocols, for instance, are, or is it 15 milligrams or 25 milligrams, et cetera. So we're doing a phase 2A as an investigator um, study to really hone in on the best protocols to move into our phase 3 that will be happening 
um, hopefully in you know late 2022, 2023, et cetera. So something that we're very excited about. There hasn't been much research into you know the different molecules inside psilocybin containing mushrooms. Yeah. And you know there's preliminary research. A lot of people are most concerned about psilocybin and psilocin, um, but there's other molecules like norocilocin, baocystin, norbaocystin, etc. Is your company focused on exploring these this entourage effects of, of, of the multiples of, of different compounds inside of these mushrooms? Um, yeah, the answer to your question is, is, is absolutely. So this morning, actually, we announced, put out a press release um, that at the University of Alberta, which is where the vast majority of um, our psychedelic research takes place, we have identified and now classified over 40 active compounds that have never been discovered or classified or categorized from psychedelic producing mushrooms. We screened over 25 different varietals um, to actually uncover what these compounds are. And then something really unique at the University of Alberta that we have access to is their AI technology. So we're able to effectively instantaneously take a number of compounds and instantaneously screen them um, to find out if they're active or not, right? So something that five years ago would have taken a decade for individuals to, to, to do and millions of dollars we're able to do very inexpensively um, and quickly and efficiently. So what we're finding is exactly what you indicated, that there's much more going on um, in these psilocybin producing mushrooms than just psilocybin or psilocin, which we, 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 we did know or we, I guess, anecdotally knew, if you look at kind of ancient shamanistic practices going way, way back, right? When they use psilocybin mushrooms for shamanistic practices or whatever it might be, in many cases, they have two or three different varietals that are used for different things, right? So what that's telling you is that they have different effects, obviously, which means that there's much more going on than just psilocybin or psilocin. There's an interaction of different tryptamines, compounds, etc. So obviously, we're very interested in understanding that. And I think that these compounds, which is really interesting to us, especially with our AI technologies, hold the potential to go far outside of just mental health, right? Everybody's focused on just serotonin receptor bases, which is fine because right. we know that psilocybin and psilocin bind to different serotonin receptors, but nobody's really looking at outside the box. So what we're able to do with our AI technology is, again, instantaneously take these compounds that now we know are active and screen them against millions of receptor bases to see where the unique hits are. So, you know, we're really pioneering some very interesting research up there. And we're going to continue to expand upon our library of genetics that we can, you know, really, really kind of rip apart on an individual level. We like to call it the coin star of, of compounds. Take them down on an individual level, understand what they do individually, understand the potential, and then look to maybe reformulate and put them together for the ultimate goal of, of trying to eliminate things like anxiety, um, et cetera, to be able to have really the ultimate formula, if you will. And this scanning technology isn't just for, you know, entheogenic mushrooms. This is for all mushrooms and potentially pretty much all uh, biomaterials, right? All plant-based, uh, you know, materials and things like that. So that that's really exciting. Obviously, entheogenic mushrooms have a lot more economic incentive right now, but you know, it, it's also very exciting for our understanding of the natural world around us, um, especially just we know such a small fraction of the natural world around us, but to, you know, look under the hood, so to speak, of what is actually going on, right? And if we ingest some of these, you know, uh, bio substances, how is that interacting with our body and to gain a deeper understanding and also for the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry of you know how can we create new drugs for people that yeah. can really have a a, a a great impact on their life or even help better understand the whole plant right if if you know we have herbalists or whatever what's going on what are those actives and and have a a, a wider view so is that kind of what you're doing with Midas in health sciences is is looking using this technology for you know functional mushrooms and and uh, 
more mushrooms than just the entheogenic ones. A hundred percent. So obviously you have your usual suspects. So 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 just just so your your um, listeners understand. So we have really two kind of divisions, right? One is Midas and Health Sciences. We have a dedicated seventy five hundred square foot lab. Uh, here in Colorado, it's really the first kind of of its kind of a specialty mycology lab with end-to-end technology capabilities um, ranging from all the bench top that you could ever want to HPLC to you name it, we pretty much have it um, in that facility. And we're looking at specifically functional mushrooms and different compounds found in mushrooms like cordyceps or cordyceptin, but looking at ways to kind of refine and piggyback off of some of Rob's work that he did in the cannabis space. He was the first to use CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology on the cannabis plant to isolate different character traits and create a singleized compound cannabis plant. So a CBD only plant, a CBG only plant, a THC only plant, obviously resulting in a much more fruitful plant specifically to that compound, right? It's not wasting energy on on different compounds not of interest. Same thing is true um, in, in these different um, functional mushroom basis. So we are not interested in really producing end user products. We're more of a, a scientifically driven IP company um, that really wants to increase efficiencies and, and look at the ways to you know create new genetics that exploit compounds of interest, but also, like you said, understand much more fruitfully, I guess, and much more in depth. What are these compounds doing? And, 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 and what are their potentials? So we know things like hericinones, hericinines, and lion's mane, or cordyceptin, et cetera, can be really good for a variety of different things because there's been some baseline research, but nothing, more, right. no, nothing much, much, much more in depth from that. And there's also a very limited supply in these mushrooms, right? Like hericinones, hericinines occupy maybe 1% or 2%. Same thing as, as like a psilocybin or psilocin. And, in, in, a, in a psilocybin producing mushroom, right? It's a very small percentage base of the overall composition of the mushrooms. Right. So, you know, looking at ways to isolate those compounds, create genetics that specifically produce that compounds much more fruitfully. But like you said, also classify a significant, which we're doing, a significant amount of other compounds that could be of interest or potentially could be, you never know, the next penicillin, right? I mean, that came from a fungal source and it was kind of an accident. So you don't know right. what you're going to stumble upon, but what we do know is that you know the fungal world is is incredibly exciting from a multitude of different aspects so i really like that approach and i, I respect it because a lot of people say, say cordyceps for example are you know only concerned with cordycepin you know mm-hmm. and and that's the most famous compound in there or in entheogenic mushrooms only con- concerned with psilocybin so to speak or psilocin and so to do to look under the hood but then also be able if there's other compounds that um are actives or they help with the entourage effect um we can use this technology to enhance it right um and this is what we've seen in cannabis this is what we've seen um you know even in in micro remediation this is how we make it on the in- industrial scale right um Sure, there's naturally occurring fungi that can degrade toxic waste, but we can use this technology if we know the enzymes. We can enhance a, a fungal species to produce more of them to right to to better degrade that toxic waste. And same, if we know these pathways to produce compounds, we just produce more of them. So it's more sustainable, more economical. Um, to produce less mushrooms with more more bang for your buck, so to speak, um, and you know it, it's probably better for the environment in the long run. You only have to produce so much to to get that those uh, supportive effects on the body. So I, I think that's really really cool what you guys are doing. Yeah, no, absolutely, and it's something that we're very excited about as well. You know, it's it's the Midasen Center of Mycology, MyCom is what we call it um, in Colorado, and. You know, we, we, we're starting to look at opportunities to collaborate and offer um, intern programs with, you know, University of Denver, University of Colorado. Many of our scientists come from um, those schools already. So, um, you know, to look at, at, at ways to offer internships because this is incredibly promising, an incredibly promising field. Like you said, microremediation, right? And it's incredible that that can happen and it's from a naturalistic source, right? So there's a ways that you can take that 
completely take that as a starting point and modify it to be much more effective and much more pointed. And you can really potentially solve a lot of the world's problems with these simple, you know, these, these, these simple fungal sources. So obviously, you know, that's not our main focus. Um, we're, we're, when you, anytime you build a business, you can't be, have too many tentacles out there, especially startups, right? So we are hyper focused right. on, on what we're doing. But at the same time, you know, we, we, that doesn't mean that because of our capabilities, we can't have side projects or side interest or a platform where other companies can come and utilize our space to collaborate and maybe look at some of uh, those, those other um, alternative potentials as well. Yeah, this is so awesome. You guys are like a hub of discovery and this uh, spaces like this exist for cannabis now and they did before for plants and other drugs, but to have a mycocentric and mycoliterate lab to the mm -hmm. sophistication that you guys are going for is so exciting. And I think something that the United States has been way overdue for so thanks for pioneering this and establishing it. I just have to say from the little that I do know about fungi, they are chemical machines and the ability to look at their genetics, like, you, I mean, there's so many fungi that have the genes to, to express a certain compound, but don't in nature. And you can change all these environmental factors and they don't actually ever end up expressing that. But I mean, just that little bit of insight to how impressive a single species can be, how varietal that it can be. 100%. I'm so excited that you're offering internships and I hope our listeners got a little sparked up and were like, hey, this is, you know, something I could look into. So could you maybe talk a little bit about that? When are you welcoming people? What, who's eligible to come in and work in this space and what exactly can they do uh, at an intern level? Sure. So, you know, generally speaking, what we're looking at is either master's or PhD students um, from the surrounding area. So... Um, you know, we got a number of, of, of college campuses here, but University of Denver, um, DU as, it, as it's known, um, CU, the, the Buffaloes, um, and then we have a couple campuses down, downtown that are, that are uh, State University, Metropolitan State University, as well as um, CCD. So we're looking at, um, you know, either master's level or PhD students. Um, right now, we are in the process of getting ready to, to work with the universities um, to be an approved um, internship. So they're getting credit for coming to, to work for us. Obviously, you know, we needed to get it to a point internally from a, from a company that our projects were far enough along as well as our, our infrastructure was, was there to be um, respected and seen as a legitimate research um, facility as well as a legitimate research company, which now um, you know, we're definitely there for sure. Something else, too, that I want to touch on that, that is kind of in the pipeline since we're talking about MyCom, which we think is really exciting, kind of the next generation of, of getting people in the younger generation excited about um, mycology, is we're going to launch something here in, in, in Q3 or Q4. We have a full classroom um, in our facility. So something really unique about our facility that we were really excited about when we actually designed and built, um, built out the lab space but we have about a 2,000, 1,500 square foot um, classroom that we use as kind of a boardroom as well, but it's much bigger than that and it has a stage and we built all the infrastructure to be able to put on full on classes for kind of the elementary middle school level to do field trips. So we're going to start working with some of the local, um, local schooling districts to be able to offer to bring their kids to come into the lab and since we're not doing any psychedelic research at that lab as of yet, um, we do have a DEA application in, but as of right now, we're not doing anything um, around the psychedelics. And it's completely legitimate to have them come in and learn about you know, these different fungal sources, get excited about the science, and, and really kind of promote um, that next generation of potential mycologists or potential um, you know, scientists that, that maybe unlock the next big invention. So something that we're really passionate about and, and, and it, we think is a really cool initiative as well. Thanks for doing that. I, um, I don't know if you've heard of the International Medicinal Mushroom Conference, but uh, a couple years ago, it was in Nantong, China, and there was a few different companies I saw doing similar work to you uh, of, of, you know, looking for new species of fungi and a lot of times in very extreme settings like you know antarctica or in acid pools or whatever 
or volcano base or whatever and and you know looking under the hood looking what compounds are there making a whole library and then f finding out what new compounds can be of use to humans right and so it's exciting to see that happening in the u.s and then also mycoeducation from you know uh, i saw someone offering a, a preschool to phd school on my mycology in china yeah. and we're just so far behind in the u.s but where we have a leg up so to speak is in this entheogenic research where you guys could find you know 40 compounds and and these entheogenic mushrooms where so many countries they don't have that opportunity yep. so that's really really exciting and i have kind of a funny question because we interviewed dr david nichols and if you don't know who that is it of course i do yeah sorry. yeah <laughs> yeah he i mean he's groundbreaking for any listeners we probably have already released the episode but at one time he was the only person in the united states legally allowed to synthesize lsd and has been yep. groundbreaking for psychoactive pharmacology but you know we asked him how he was able to transport these compounds you know from lab to lab especially doing human clinical trials and we thought it was so funny he he said fedex yeah and so when you were just talking about you know transporting these these mushrooms or extracts or whatever it was from jamaica to alberta yeah. how did you do that and and what kind of permits what was kind of the structure to go sure. about that process sure so it took us it took us over six months okay because you have this this weird dichotomy so we have we have a, a schedule one health canada dealer's license um, that's housed at the university of alberta right through our exclusive partnership with applied pharmaceutical innovation um, and under that when you have any sort of drug development license which is basically what it is at its core um, you have a number of different amendments or allowments if you will um, that gives you you know check the box and you can do this basically and what we have on that is a very robust um, kind of set of amendments. And one of those is import, export, commercial scale, extraction, et cetera. So we have the full capabilities to do everything around Schedule 1. So we could do you know, anything that's Schedule 1 outside of, of just psilocybin. We could do anything that's Schedule 1. But on the other side of the pond over in Jamaica, because in, and obviously we know in, in Canada, right, it's, it's, it's a Schedule 1 um, substance. In Jamaica, it's listed as an agriculture product, so no different than like a button mushroom that you put on, right. on your pizza, right? So you have this incredibly weird dichotomy where they see it as just no big deal. It's a, it's a, you know, an agriculture product, and then it's a Schedule One, you know, substance that's incredibly serious. So it took us six months working with JamPro. JamPro is the Agriculture Oversight Committee in in Jamaica that oversees yep. legal import export of agricultural products and then Health Canada to develop protocols that they were both comfortable with to be able to actually cultivate in Jamaica, run it, you know, get COAs at, at University of West Indies, make sure that everything that we say is in the package is what it is, and then get the actual import permits from, well, the export permits from Jamaica and then the import permits from Health Canada to, to allow us to bring it in as far as, as far as the shipping, DHL, so no different. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I gotta tell you, you know, when it when it when it comes to you know butterflies in your stomach or nerve wracking, I must have refreshed the screen on the tracking a thousand times a day, you know, because I'm like, this cannot be real. Even though you have all of the legal paperwork that you've worked on and you made sure all the I's were dotted and T's were crossed, it's still just, it was the first in the world to ever do an international export or import of, of these, these substances, right? So it was definitely... Legally. <laughs> legally, exactly. <laughs> legally, yeah, exactly. That's the caveat, the important caveat. But it still felt like you were, you know, like you were, you were crossing some sort of gray area or, or doing something wrong. So, right, right. Um, you know, once it once it uh, landed successfully, it was a big hurrah. Okay, let's you know let's let's do another one. But um, it was definitely interesting for sure, and and something that we've been able to take full advantage of. And again, so 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 why Jamaica is so important in kind of our and to go back to what we talked about about the entourage effect. So when you look at at substances that are explicitly illegal in the vast majorities of of the jurisdictions globally. When you're bringing in those substances into a 
drug development license to be classified, it's very hard, right? It's like, how do you take something from the street, basically, and bring it into this drug development and have them be okay with it, right? So the way that Health Canada and the DEA licenses as well, but specifically for our purposes, Health Canada has the requirements is that the opposing jurisdiction or the originating jurisdiction has to have it either listed as fully legal and you have to be able to prove that. So in Jamaica, we were able to do that or it has to come from a reciprocal license like a DEA license or uh, you know, some sort of drug development license in some other jurisdiction. But they would have had to have brought their genetics in some way as well. So you're very limited to the ability to actually bring in varietals from different areas, right? So Jamaica offered us this huge open door. Is it temporary? We don't know, but it doesn't really matter because we've been able to do this for some significant amount of time. But we can com compile available genetics in, in Jamaica and then ship those up to our world-class research facility that we have the ability to really rip them apart and, and find out what's going on, um, like you said, underneath the hood. So, you know, really, really exciting stuff, really, really innovative stuff and, and uh, something that's been a lot of fun to be a part of for sure. I'm so excited to continue following your work. Uh, I had another more specific question just from like looking at your website and looking at your R&D. You mentioned a psilocybin dosing technology. Is this just helping people understand like a, a proper dose of psilocybin for macro versus micro dosing or like what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so th there's a number of different dosing technologies that we've actually been able to um, develop at, at, at Midas and, and some that are very unique to us and, and, and more specifically and something that I can talk about openly um, because a lot of these are, are still in development and, and obviously there's, there's patent work around mm -hmm. um, that but what we've been able to do on, on our Myco004 product which is um, a second generation um, that again was a starting point for the, the, the from psilocybin or psilocin so psilocybin and psilocin as compounds are not skin permeable as they stand as a molecule. They don't penetrate the skin very well at all. Um, that's why you see if, if there's a patch system it has like the myco slivers where they basically cut your skin, etc. We've been able with our drug development team, Dr. Denton Hoyer spent three decades designing small molecules at Pfizer Novartis and, and most recently was the head of small molecule design at, at Yale Medical Center in conjunction with Rob Roscoe, our CSO, and then the Faculty of Pharmacology, which is ranked top 15 in the world at University of Alberta, to tailor and iterate these different molecules to have other features. So in prior research for psilocybin, the most effective way to regulate dosing um, is intravenously. We just don't think that that's compatible with therapy. I don't like needles. Most people don't like needles. And definitely if you're under this crazy experience that can potentially be very radical and mystical, if you will, um, as it's known, you know, you don't want a, a, something sticking in your arm, right? It could be, it could have, it could have negative effects. So the second best that we saw is a patch delivery system. But again, you had an issue where the molecules don't permeate the skin. So we were able to actually uh, modify the molecule to make it permeate the skin. We have patent pending on that as well. Um, so we can apply psilocybin and all psilocybin and psilocybin-like analogs, cryptamines, etc. All is all-encompassing um, and the same mechanistic changes to that molecule actually apply and work for all of the, the different molecules. But we can apply that now, now to a patch delivery system, um, which is obviously very significant. The other um, component to MYCO004, which is um, very unique and also from the FDA's lens very important um, is when your body, so psilocybin, right? Psilocybin as a molecule is not psychoactive. Your body metabolizes it through the liver and then it creates psilocin. Psilocin is, is the psychoactive compound. The reason why people don't use psilocin in drug development for the most part is because it's not oxidatively stable or shelf stable, right? So like when the mushroom blues, bruises blue, that's basically the degradation of psilocybin um, and psilocin, and, and that's why it's bruising blue, turning into blue dye, which is obviously has no psychoactive or any sort of medicinal effects at all, right? It's just basically ruined. So we were able to create a way to keep that uh, molecule already converted to psilocin shelf stable um, for a significant amount of time, which obviously the FDA approves, but also what that does is it makes it instantaneously psychoactive. 
So obviously wow. you don't have that wait time, mm -hmm. um, which is incredibly beneficial. So, um, you know, you start to layer these different features, which creates a much better, much more scalable. And then lastly, we were able to um, tailor that molecule as well to create about a two hour half-life. So what you have in Michael 004 is a silicin um, like tryptamine that's fully shelf stable, skin permeable, and has about a two hour half-life delivered on a patch system. We, we think it's an absolute amazing second generation. We also have about five layers of patent protection um, on that, uh, on that actually, actual discovery. So something that's very unique, very exciting that we've been working heavily on for quite some time. If that's what you could tell us, I'm, I'm really curious what you have behind the scenes. <laughs> no so that's, kidding. that's really incredible. Um, yeah. and why, why a patch, um, as opposed to like orally ingestible? Yeah. So, you know, again, we, we have the way to, to make it skin permeable, which if you look at some of these dissolvable strips that people are doing, right, it's just basically a breath mint with psilocybin and then you're swallowing it the same way, right? It's, it's not, it's not yeah. very good at permeating the skin. So unless they have our feature on it. Um, then it really doesn't make it better in our opinion. Um, but the answer to your question is, is, you know, we think that patch is, is very compatible with, um, with therapy. One of our addiction protocols already, what's out in the, in the public markets is a patch system to make them, um, you know, to, to it, try to help them quit. It's very ineffective, but that's what's already attributed to it. But also it's, it's soothing and we think it's, it's a very, very controllable uptake time, right? It doesn't, it goes directly through your skin and to your blood and then, uh, you know, you're, you're off to the races. So it's very controllable. Um, it's unique. A lot of people in, in traditional pharmaceuticals, they don't use patch because they're generic drug makers trying to lower the cost down to next to nil. Obviously in this particular substance or in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, right, that you have one to three treatments where you're actually utilizing the substance. So cost is not so much of an issue, right? Because obviously it's probably going to be a very expensive treatment either way. Insurance is, is going to have to pay for it to make it viable. But um, anyways, needless to say, that's, that's why we, we uh, chose for that specific product. But like you said, you know what I mean? We have libraries of compounds, libraries of inventions. So we have um, other delivery mechanisms as well that are in development. I have um, a chemistry question, and I'm not a chemist. I don't know if you can speak to this, I'm but you talked about you're not either. No, 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 I'm not. We have much smarter people on my team than. Okay. <laughs> that, but I'll, uh, if, if you let me know the question. I'll I give can. it a shot. Okay, so yeah. you are altering the psilocybin or, or psilocin molecules to be permeable through the skin. So when I when you look at this molecule, it's maybe not technically considered psilocin anymore or it's close enough that it will still bind to the same receptors but has your team investigated the difference between orally ingesting psilocybin versus doing your patch psilocybin with whatever extra atoms that you needed to latch on for it to go through the skin and how much if at all do they differ in neurochemistry yeah so so what we've been very cognitive of in designing um, that specific molecule is not changing um, the properties as it pertains to how it affects and binds to different receptor bases, but also the effects that it has on your body, right? These are iterations that change the structure um, that make it permeate the skin specifically, but as far as the effects that it has on humans, um, we believe through our, our preclinical studies that they're going to be identical. There's no difference. Um, things that, you know, we're altering as far as effects are concerned is half-life. Um, but as far as the mystical experience, what you're going to undergo, um, the introspectiveness of it, et cetera, we're not changing um, that, that, that side of things um, at all, we hope. So cannabis blew up, and you probably had a, a big uh, <laughs> hand in, in making that happen. Uh, do, you, do you feel like psilocybin will be bigger? Or do you think there's a bottleneck because of the rules and regulations and laws that it can only grow so much um, in, in that kind of uh, environment? Yeah, so totally, totally different approach. Um, recreational marketplace for, for cannabis, uh, we see and have zero interest in a recreational psilocybin or psychedelics market for that, that matter at all. Um, I think that you know, what people do on their own recreationally is, is, their, is their own 
um, their own choices and, and listen, you know, if you want to go do um, some psychedelic mushrooms, that's fine. Be, be, be safe, et cetera. But, but if it's not in a controlled environment, it's not as effective to um, actually treat successfully ailments, right? The psychotherapy protocols and the psychotherapy aspect of this is so important. And if it's not coming from a trained clinician or therapist in a very controlled setting, sometimes you can have you know, negative effects, et cetera, and ultimately that can ruin an industry for um, the masses, right? I think that uh, from a decrim standpoint, we're big proponents of it from a state um, program, as long as it's done responsibly. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're big supporters of it. For instance, um, in Oregon, um, Dave Kopalak at Emerge Law Group, I've worked with him in cannabis uh, for over 10 years. Um, I, I was one of the first licenses in Oregon as well. Um, and he was one of the main architects on that bill out there. I think they took a responsible approach. So we wrote him a check. We supported that initiative. Unfortunately, we can't actually participate in the operational side of that because it's state we're going after federal FDA approval on drugs and you just can't cross that, um, that line in the sand. It's a very, very strict line in the sand. But for us, anything that's done responsibly that promotes the overall acceptance, like we are, we're, we're big time supporters of, right? Um, but as far as, as the way that the market is and the size and potential of the market, again, I think it's two totally different ball games. One is a pharmaceutical marketplace that we're creating real FDA, Health Canada, global equivalent of drugs that are displacing over $100 billion of dangerous, unsuccessful pharmaceutical drugs that people have, have been complacent taking for you know, decades for no apparent reason other than just not thinking outside the box and not looking at what's already really kind of been in front of you. So you're displacing with much more effective treatments, huge amounts of dollars. So I think that this marketplace is significantly bigger than the cannabis industry. But again, it's a much more scientifically pharmaceutically led um, right. marketplace as opposed to a recreational side of things. Totally. And like cannabis is something that people can participate in daily but psilocybin doesn't seem like a habitual thing as much amino vice obviously there's microdosing, but mm -hmm. you know the goal of it is to to stop consuming it right to, to be okay um so it is a very different models um but it's it's great to see people who have gone through the legislation of legalizing cannabis into the mushroom space to do it right the second time, right? This is our resurgence, and it's it seems to be going really well because responsible, really intelligent people are on board. Absolutely. What um, what worries you about this booming industry? Uh, do you think there's there are any caveats to the the growing economy of psilocybin? Uh, I'm I'm seeing companies pop up left and right and going public left and right and. You know, there's a lot of money being poured into the space, uh, and yeah, what is there anything that keeps you up at night, or you know, you see as maybe a potential downfall? Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, in any emerging markets, that you're taking something that's so taboo for good, bad, or ugly reasons doesn't matter why, and bringing it and trying to get public acceptance, right? It's it's very hard and you have a lot of naysayers and you have a lot of people hoping that you're going to fail. And you're also dealing with competitive landscapes of very large pharmaceutical companies that we're potentially replacing very profitable drugs of. So they're also going to look at ways to, you know, how do we poo poo this or um, look at ways that, that you, um, you know, to, to, to make it look at, looked at or viewed in a, in a negative connotation and how that happens is by bad actors, bad players. And any time that you see this emerging markets and this many companies going public, this quickly, this late in the game with no IP, no substance, no nothing, right? And they're just basically, we call them PowerPoint companies. It's really bad for the industry because all that is is just a stock promote or something of that nature that people are looking to make a quick buck. And ultimately people are gonna lose money on the deal and nothing is going to happen um, fundamentally with the company. And you're going to have a lot of, you know, very angry people. And 
that's what we that that's what concerns us is the me too companies that jump out and just try to ride the wave with really no intention of discovering or helping people or really making any sort of scientific progress at all or no ability to do that either right so um you know that's concerning um also you know it's it's concerning with um kind of the attention anytime the spotlights come on 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 certain substances, these are incredibly safe substances if they're used right, right? If, the sa if you look at a safety profile of psilocybin, um, comparatively speaking to an SSRI, let's take it, it's not even comparable, right? Like this is much more safe than an SSRI or a traditional pharmaceutical as far as side effects are concerned. And you're also only looking to use one to three macro doses in a traditional protocol and it's curative potentially, right? This isn't an everyday pill, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's not used properly, there is the potential for people to do things when you're under the influence that could really put a bad mark on the industry and make it look like this is just this crazy psychedelic experience and something, somebody jumped out of a window or something crazy like that, right? Because that does happen if it's not used responsibly. So the emergence of an ease to access potentially um, when people see an underground market, that concerns me because it's, it's, it's just, you're always gonna have, uh, there's nothing but bad that can happen about that, right? An un unregulated market, et cetera. So that, that is, is very concerning for me. But ultimately, you know, when you, when you take good companies and there's a number of them in the space that we like and we work with and we support each other, et cetera, um, that are doing really good work with major research institution as well, right? And ultimately what wins is data. And it's, it's, it's undeniable how good the data and the science, um, you know, the, 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 different, the different data points that are coming out of these clinicals, whether that's MAPS um, or even COMPASS or a lot of the Hopkins work. Um, you know, we're very close with a lot of the guys over at Hopkins and, and we're collaboratively with them as well. Um, but, you know, that's what's ultimately gonna take the naysayers to be supporters is stories, word of mouth, and then ultimately data is how you really convert the, the, the masses. So as long as that continues um, and there's, there's no bad players that emerge, then I think we should be fine. Thank you for your insight. Uh, and then two kind of wrapping up questions. One is how can citizen scientists help you, if at all, you know, people who are dedicated to the space and just want to support your awesome work and two what does Midasin need the most uh, say there's listeners who are in college right now or just are paying attention to this space what do you guys what kind of minds do you need to show up more than any other I don't think it's, it's necessarily you know what, what kind of minds do we need um, citizen scientists listen I mean write our info at um, please um, reach out to Midas on, on LinkedIn, Facebook, etc. We love to collaborate. We love your ideas. We love to, to, to kick ideas off of you. Um, obviously, you know, from our lab perspective, um, we're very collaborative there as well in the Colorado lab. The, the lab at the University of Alberta is obviously much more restrictive. We have a, a, you know, a federal drug development license there, so the protocols are completely different and collaboration is much more limited on what we can do. But us as a company, listen, I mean, we support the citizen scientist. Um, as far as the type of mind that we need, you know, when, when we need um, jobs, we like to employ everybody, but of course, that's just not realistic. Um, when we need jobs, we post them on, on LinkedIn, et cetera, and they're very pointed, very specific um, job titles. Um, but keep your eyes out for that if you uh, are listening and, and, and look for, um, you know, kind of that, that next step that we're taking from a human capital side. And it will happen, so stay tuned. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I super appreciate the work you're doing and for the hour that you've dedicated to answer our questions. And there are thousands of listeners out there who will get a lot of value from this. Fantastic. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you.